Hi everyone. My name is Jolt, uh, and today I'm going to talk about how we managed to transform GameSys from a monolithic, manually released architecture to something more DevOps -y with microservices and, and uh, continuous uh, deployments. Uh, I'm going to introduce the company a bit later, but first I'm going to ask a bit about you. Uh, I just want to know, just raise your hand, whether you think you're mostly in the developer architect part? Just the <laughs> operations or operations architect? That's good, because I, I plan with a lot of operations jokes. So <laughs> Offend most of you. Uh, any managers? Nah, okay. <laughs> I also have some manager jokes, just, just, just to make sure. So, uh, I went to a lot of uh, conferences in the past, and uh, went to a lot of DevOps conferences, and where people talk about DevOps. I learned one really important thing, that you have to include this slide. So, I just have to uh, include this. I also learned that there's a lot of talk about technology, and how you do... Uh, <clears throat> how you basically do one of the technology parts, like how you use Ansible, how you use Docker. But I'm mainly trying to talk about the people side a bit, because that's also important. And that's where, for example, we managed to... We were a bit behind. Uh, we haven't considered... We, we've considered technology, we've considered, yeah, using Docker is good, using Kubernetes is good, using Ansible is good, but we haven't really considered the effects on how uh, adding this technology into a fairly large company would affect people. And uh, just as previously as uh, <coughs> DevOps has like two parts, development and operations, it also has two sides, the technical side and the people side. So uh, usually there's two approaches on how you would generally think how a company would introduce DevOps principles, uh, especially if it's a fairly, it's an older company. And one of them is the top to bottom approach. This is where managers higher up basically tell you, from tomorrow we're going to do DevOps because we went to a conference and we heard DevOps is good, DevOps is awesome. So from tomorrow we're big doing DevOps. And so that's one, one of the ways. Obviously the other way is more like the bottom up approach where uh, the developers or operations teams figure out that something's not right, something needs to be changed, and, and try to push uh, changes upwards. So, uh, we basically did a mixed approach. We used both aspects, uh, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. So, a bit introduction to GameSys. We are a gambling company. We do online gaming based on slots, casino, and bingo games. We have more than 1,000 employees now and around 40% work in technical parts. Uh, it is a very, very Java-based company. Uh, we use JVM mostly. In the past, we even used Java on the front end, which was probably not a good idea. We switched to JavaScript, meanwhile. Uh, we have developers in both in London, we have our operations team in Malta, which is a fair distance to make sure communication is a bit hard between the two parts. And let's talk about why we wanted to change. So as I've said, there's the top to bottom and the bottom to top approach. As a fairly old Java-based company, we obviously had an organically grown monolith. We didn't really have DevOps as a solution. No one wanted to say, hey, from tomorrow, you have to use uh, continuous deployment, continuous delivery, and stuff like that. We had a completely different problem, which we wanted a solution for. And our main problem was that because of the organically grown monolith we had, we weren't really agile. <coughs> This was the release graph of our monolith, so basically our dependency graph. Uh, every month, we had to go from top to bottom based on this really nice little image and manually 
tag and release each of the components of our monolith. It took a while, and this is just one of our monolith. We have a few more of this. There were circular dependencies where you had to tag something and then tag the other one and then tag the original again. Uh, it was error prone. If you miss something, you might have forgotten to include some really important feature for the release. And basically, even if we had like month releases, this meant two weeks of coding and two weeks of making sure that your code could actually go live. Uh, lots of problems with communication between teams uh, and lots of time also spent actually testing your, your monolith to make sure that it, that it works, which basically meant for every four weeks, only two weeks was properly spent at, at coding and at making sure there are new features, and two weeks was spent making sure that you can actually release what you've coded. So <clears throat> this wasn't good. Uh, monthly releases, we had really costly downtimes during releases. Uh, every release cost us like four hours of downtime, which even if we did at an off-peak time, cost us money. Uh, there were costly meetings between teams every day. We, all of the teams, which is for 400 people, a fair amount of people, uh, coming together in so-called scrum of scrums, trying to figure out what what problems are. Obviously, always there's one team missing and they are causing the problems later and, and stuff like that. There's late integration issues. People are like, okay, we've, uh, we are the last one who merge, to, to merge our changes in and obviously it breaks everything else. Now we need to retag. now we need to rethink our approach. We are past code freeze time. Can we please, this is just a minor change, can we please really, really put it into the release? And like, no, you can't, but you're still going to try it. And then the whole release gets pushed back. So, uh, this was the main problem we, we wanted to solve. We needed a way to not have this, to, to, to make sure that we have a way to split up the monolith, to move to something. Back then, we, we heard the microservices are really good, and, and we wanted to, to move to this. So first, we wanted to create a platform that allows people to create microservices easily, because if you can create microservices easily, then hopefully uh, you'll be able to, <clears throat> to, to start on the new platform. You're going to create new microservices. They are going to be deployed easily. And sooner or later, our, our monolith will get smaller and smaller. We needed a way to deploy these microservices, obviously, because the fact that you can create it is, is usually not enough. Then we got the new problem. Now, microservices were really, really easily created, but operations is now overloaded with the manual deployments, because previously, they only had to release one big uh, var file every month. Now they had to release 10 bit smaller jar files every month, which for them wasn't really anything better. So we went to them and, and tried to ask them, hey, can we, ha can we help you automate your process? And, and while we're there, while we're automating all of the deployments on live, uh, let's try to do the exact same thing on the developer side. So, before I go into a bit more specific details, I'm going to talk about two case studies on what we had before the changes, before we introduced uh, the new tools, and what we had after we introduced the new tools. So a first uh, example is a positive example where moving to, to the new architecture really helped us is the Ruby upgrade. Now, as I've said before, we are a Java-based company, but every large company has some fringe technologies. Someone had an idea that Ruby is going to solve one particular problem really good. And we basically had one really important uh, Ruby on Rails application. And we wanted to upgrade Ruby from 1.8 to 1.9. 1 1.8 was already end of life and stuff like that. I'm not sure whether you know, but this is a similar change to these other six examples. There's a fair amount of change between 1.8 and 1.9. So we, we braced ourselves. It's probably not going to be easy. And the main problem with the upgrade was with operations. 
we had Ruby on the boxes, we didn't have Docker, we didn't have technologies like that. So the, the conversation between us developers and operations went something like this. Hey operations, can you please upgrade Ruby on the boxes? And then there was a bit of time spent and they come back, sorry, we can't do that, we're still on Red Hat 6, Red Hat 6 doesn't support Ruby 1.9. We also can't upgrade from Red Hat 6 because then it will break the current boxes, so you can't do that. Okay, but can you try to find like another RPM or something like that? And they were like, oh, sorry, there's no, no available ones uh, for Red Hat 6, so we, you'll, you'll, you'll be stuck with Ruby 1.8. Can you try to compile it from source? No, because on live machines we don't want GCC. Can you try to compile it in a different box and then move it to live? And then, ah, no, because apparently our staging environment, the live environment, is not exactly the same, so they have sec faults if we try that. Now, obviously, each of these communications took one to two weeks. <clears throat> because it takes some time to, to, for them to, to try it out. And eventually we did manage to upgrade. It was a hugely convoluted steps where we installed GCC on a hidden live machine, installed Ruby, removed GCC, and then, oh, there's a new Ruby. So it took six months. Now uh, I tried to bit a, do, uh, so I did overly dramatize a bit. It wasn't actually six months. I did check, it was only five months and three weeks. So it took us almost half a year just to upgrade Ruby from 1.8 to 1.9. After that, we introduced these new technologies. We dockerized our Ruby on Rails application. So we then tried to upgrade Ruby from 1.9 to 2.1. This was a bit later. It was a much more relaxing experience. This is the change we had to do, just change the, the Docker file. It took one week, including testing and deploying and releasing. Uh, the only drawback of this was that, uh, as I've said, our operations team work in Malta, and the first time uh, we did the upgrade, I was promised that because the upgrade is so convoluted, I might get a trip to Malta, but because it was so easy the next time, I didn't get it. I had to remain in London. <laughs> So this was a positive example of how simple technical changes and new tools can help you, especially with, with potentially fringe technologies inside your companies. Now I'm going to do a negative example, which is going to be the Java upgrade. You might be wondering if the Ruby upgrade was so much better, why is the Java upgrade a negative example? And that's simple. It's because Java was the norm in the company and we had established processes. For example, we had an established process on how to do Java upgrade. First of all, the security teams got an email from Oracle or from their vendors or just from blogs. There's a new Java version, you really need to upgrade, it fixes a lot of security bugs. If you don't upgrade, we lose PCI compliance, etc. So they said, okay, there's a new release. Release management, which is a separate team, please try to create a, a new ticket for the operations team to, to prepare for this release. The operations team got the ticket, they assigned engineers, probably more multiple engineers because we have a lot of Java applications, and the engineers then SSH to the boxes, installed the new Java version, restarted the boxes, everything was happy. So what has happened since after we upgraded Docker? Obviously, the security team said, oh, there's a new version, Release management started planning for the release. Operations assigned engineers, and the engineers was like, okay, we can't SSH anymore, we have Docker boxes. So they did what every sensible person would do. They went to Google Co. UK, they typed in how to access Docker machines, then they SSH to the boxes, run Docker exec container, and install the Java upgrade. So if you know how Docker works, you know this is definitely not how you upgrade Java. Worst case scenario, it breaks everything. Best case scenario, it does nothing. So obviously, where's the problem? The problem that in this process, developers were completely skipped, even before the upgrade and obviously after the upgrade. Because how do developers do Java upgrade? They click that button. That's how every sensible developer does Java upgrade on their boxes, on OS X. On Windows, it's even more convoluted because you have like a UAC pop-up as well. 
So what's the main difference between this and the Ruby one? The Ruby one had, was a fringe technology. Operations didn't really want to help us or they didn't really want to care. So once we dockerized it, they were really, really eager that, to, to get it out because now it's just a random Docker container they can run. They didn't really care afterwards whether it's Ruby or Python or Java or whatever. It's just a container they can deploy. With Java, there was a bit of a difference because we already had lifelong established processes within the company. We had teams responsible for a wide range of stuff. And the fact that some teams decided to now use Docker, they really didn't help in, in regards of, of modifying these old processes because <clears throat> as shown, even like a small change like this, you, you need to make sure that everyone in the company understands it, otherwise you might get into, into trouble. In this Java case, uh, we didn't actually figure out at that time that there was something missing. Everyone thought the Java upgrade went well. It was just a few weeks later when someone realized that we're still using the old version. <laughs> when we were told that, hey, there's probably a problem with, with your Docker containers, and that's when we realized the whole problem, and that's when we had to actually go to people and, and tell them, yeah, this old process that doesn't work anymore, now you have to involve us in, into the process. Afterwards, it was as simple as just changing the line, one line in, in the Docker container. So let's get back to our road to DevOps and, and what we did and, and how we did this whole transformation. So it all started with TalkWorks Technology Editor. It's a nice piece of manual technology. I'm not sure whether you know it, it's a tech radar. You go to, the, uh, some companies have it, most notably, I think Thoughtful started this process. You go to their site and there's four boxes like techniques, tools, platforms, languages and frameworks. You click on each of them and it contains a list of technologies which the company is assessing. Like they already started using it, they are assessing and it looks nice. They looked at it, but they don't know what to do with it, and they looked at it and tell other people to stay away. So there's like four categories for each technology. There's like, I don't know, Kubernetes is in the, in the inner one, it's, it's a good technology, but for example, overzealous API frameworks, they have it in the, in the hold, in the outer category where it might be useful for some companies, but don't just invest them in blindly. So, <clears throat> One of the ideas there was to establish a platform team. It was actually in their hold pattern, so it might be good, but don't do it blindly. And they explicitly said, having a platform team uh, is good for research and development. You have one team who can specifically code on, on moving your infrastructure along, but don't make it long lasting, because otherwise they'll just become a bottleneck. So the platform team was built up from the members of different teams. They were set up to drive the move to microservices. They had more leeway in assessing new technologies. They, they basically had free time to, to try out multiple different stuff. It wasn't like they were said, probably if Spring Boot is good, use it. They actually could try out lots of different technologies. They could even move outside of the JavaScope to, to test out stuff. And it was started to create a common platform. Back then it was decided Drop Wizard looked like a good idea. Uh, they drove a standard way of specifying our APIs based on like uh, the hate OS and hell principles. So it's not just a plain REST endpoint, it also communicates to true links what you can do uh, within the endpoints and, and stuff like that. We started using Epigee, another Pattern, hold pattern from the tech radar, do not use overzealous uh, API frameworks, but we only use APG just, just as a proxy. And basically DevOps wasn't actually part of the setup. It was just making sure that we have a, a way of creating new microservices and to fix a few problems with our, uh, our endpoints. <clears throat> the next step we did we started was virtual API teams uh, because even in our previous monolith, we had huge, uh, we, it was a REST-based uh, monolith. We had huge amount of REST endpoints. The main problem was that everyone was just adding their own endpoints for 
really, really small and specific technologies. And uh, we had a huge amount of duplications. For example, uh, we had around 10 different endpoints to do the exact same thing, getting the member details uh, out from, from the monolith. And we had 10 different endpoints because each of the 10 different teams who needed the member details needed a slightly different view on it. So instead of having like one endpoint that caters for everyone or, or having some options to make sure it caters for everyone, we had 10 different REST endpoints to do the same stuff. And obviously they had like guest slash member, guest slash members, guest slash member slash ID. They all did the same thing, it's just, uh, <coughs> they were basically uh, still separate. If we wanted to change any of them, we first had to figure out who are, who are the ones who are calling these endpoints. Some of the endpoints we realized no one's calling them anymore, but they were still there. Uh, sometimes we were like, okay, we, we asked around, no one was using an endpoint, we tried to remove it, and then we figured out it's used by some monthly uh, logging process, reporting process from data warehouse, which we haven't figured out, because, I mean, it wasn't in the logs, especially because it was like a monthly call. So one idea was to introduce virtual API teams. It's an idea from Brian Mulloy. It basically uh, says that in order to, to restart your, your APIs, especially if you already have APIs but they're in a mess, you should get together, as, uh, again, members from each domain team to, to talk about what your domain requires and then try to standardize the APIs. Uh, we've met uh, every week. We decided on the standards of the APIs. Standards are just like simple stuff, like how you do pagination. Previously, we had 10 different ways of using pagination. Some of them were like uh, page size and page no. Others used offset and limit. A third was using uh, headers. A fourth team didn't use pagination at all. So these were the stuff that you, it's probably good to standardize on it, because then every user of any of the APIs will know that, yeah, if this is a paginated resource, I I'm always know that it's offset and limit. I don't need to go into the contracts, their value into the details. So these were just the plain standards of the API. It wasn't like large, larger scale stuff that you, you always have to use, I don't know, at most six characters for your domain name and stuff like that. It was literally just about plain naming for stuff that occurs across potentially multiple APIs. And this API team went together, we assessed uh, all of the new APIs for the first uh, few months and made sure that every new API adheres to the standards and if there's a new thing that we needed to assess, for example, because we used the uh, HATOS and HELP principles, which meant, for example, uh, all APIs also contain links to the resources it gathered the data from, it contains links on what you can do next. Uh, <coughs> we had some like things that we needed to standardize on, for example, how to use links from other APIs, how to do versioning if you need to use links from other APIs, etc. Next one was using Ansible, Docker, GoCD, and all of the really, really DevOps stuff. And we only started this because we had a problem. Steam started to create microservices, but there was still no easy way of deploying them. Because as I've said previously, it was really good that new teams could do new microservices. Every team was like, oh yeah, it's really awesome that we can do now microservices. We don't need to touch the monolith. We just create a new microservice for this particular scenario. But if there's no easy way of deploying them, you're just overloading operations because the release ticket for actually deploying these new microservices was the same for any of these microservices that it was for the monolith. Basically, please install this jar into this location, then restart it, then blah, blah, blah. Uh, and it overloaded operations, it was a manual process, it was error prone, there were cases where only some of the services had the new updated microservices. So that's when we decided to, okay, let's introduce containers, because deploying jar files is probably not the future. We should actually deploy Docker containers. 
But we went a bit further because just having containers might not solve the whole problem of our operations. So we made sure that the actual artifact that the operations team is deploying is not the Docker container, it's the full instru uh, instruction on how to deploy it. Uh, so we used Ansible, so instead of like uh, just saying, hey, here's a Docker container, we sent them a zip containing Ansible playbooks and told them, just please deploy, just, just run the playbook. That's what you need to do. And the playbook will take care of actually deploying the Docker container, all of the boxes, stop it, uh, run the migration scripts. If there's a problem, roll it back, etc. And it took away a huge amount of uh, potential issues from the deployments, because if something was failing, they could just send us the Ansible logs, we could investigate it, we can pinpoint the problem. There wasn't any more issues where, for example, previously, uh, we, we, we basically send them a list of scripts to do, and they were skipping on some of the steps because the eyes went one line below, and that was like the, the line to run database migrations. Then obviously everything failed. So just giving them the script that they can just run made it much easier, both for, for them and for us as well. And while we are there, now because everything is, is, autom is automated, we can, do the, we can just run the same scripts, not just on staging and live, we can run it on, on local as well. So every, <coughs> every developer can just run the exact same scripts on all environments, whether it's live, local, uh, one of the staging environments, which uh, made it much more easier also for them to, to develop against. And also we needed an, in, an easy way of actually building this stuff. Uh, we started using OCD as a CD framework. Previously we used a really, really old version of Hudson, uh, which was already outdated back then. So this was a huge uh, step towards this. And we pushed everything to Git. Uh, including the pipeline configurations for, for GoCD, which was also a, a good idea. At the moment, GoCD didn't support this feature. It was something we, we pushed uh, to them to, to introduce that you can actually use, uh, your pipeline configuration can live uh, separately from the Go. The next big feature, which was also part of the tech radar, is legacy in a box. Uh, the next problem was, now we have new microservices, you can easily deploy them, but because your monolith still contains 90% of the business logic, they are either reliant on the monolith, you are reliant on the monolith, something needs to be changed there, it, it still slows progress. So obviously our legacy uh, monolith was really hard to set up and test, it was hard to deploy, you might remember my the really nice dependency graph. So let's try to change the monolith to look like a microservice. Obviously these are, this was, was like a large backend var file. Maybe we could just pack it into a Docker container, add the usual Ansible scripts to it and make sure it's deployable. Or at least make sure it can be deployed the same way as one, uh, which we did. Now obviously this is a good idea to to make sure that your legacy stuff looks like a microservice, it will still not be one. For example, the Docker container which runs our own old legacy stuff boots in 20 minutes. Now that's not a microservice, but at least it's easy to deploy. And uh, finally, <coughs> our last big organizational change was uh, vertical team structure. Before that, backend and frontend teams were separated. We had backend teams working on the backend stuff. We had frontend teams working on the frontend stuff. That wasn't optimal. Communication was, was really uh, a problem. Teams were going at different speed. Usually backend teams finished the feature. Frontend teams only had like two sprints later time to work on that. Then they realized that we were actually missing data, so it had to come back to the, to the backend teams. So it was easy to do. We just had to merge the two teams together. And, and make sure that they were related to various domain concerns with the exception of the platform team. So obviously the platform team didn't really have anything front-end specific, so it remained more or less uh, a back-end team. 
Now, there were pros and cons of each, each stuff. The pros for using a platform team is it's, they're very quick to assess and introduce new technologies. The standardized framework allowed really quick introduction of new microservices, which uh, was really good. Making the artifact, the deployment instru instructions meant teams could automate their special deployment requirements really well. So if, if any team had uh, to, to create like a, a, a container or something that, really, that needed something special for them, like multiple databases or, or a really special kind of migration, they could do it. Cons, it wasn't short-lived. Based on the ideas, it should be short-lived, but it wasn't. It was started two years ago, and we still have a platform team. It became a support team for, for the framework they did, and the pros of having the platform wasn't communicated well enough, because most devs thought they had to join the platform team to actually work with DevOps technologies, which wasn't really good. For the virtual API team, pros, it made sure that knowledge around HATO as hell and uh, the ideas behind not just RESTful APIs, but HATO as based APIs were dispersed good into the teams. Uh, they made a lot of well-documented decisions around the standards, but initially, I mean, it was only an initial problem because there was a huge adoption of microservices and new APIs. The API team became a huge bottleneck of actually approving new APIs and talking about that. For Ansible, the, these are the backbones of our, of our DevOps technologies. For the cons of using this is we didn't really have any upgrade strategy. Uh, and the more they were used, the harder it was to, to upgrade them. Especially Ansible was a big problem because uh, especially between Ansible 1.9 and 2.0 and after from 2.0 to 2.1, there are a few not so well documented backward incompatible changes. And it's really hard to use different versions of Ansible because then you have to make sure to always install the proper version and stuff like that. Legacy in the box, it removed the convoluted build and deployment process. This was the main idea behind the whole DevOps transformation. This was the, the main stuff that was the top to bottom approach where the manager said, we need to get rid of this and we got rid of this. And meanwhile, we actually managed to transform to a more DevOps company. And it really, really made it easy to make changes to the legacy monolith. It, it wasn't uh, now that someone was like, oh, I have to work with the legacy monolith. People were like, actually not happy, but they were like, okay, with picking up the stories. It wasn't left in the backlog for months because no one wanted to, to pick up the story. The biggest problem of using legacy in a box is that it really made it easy to make changes to legacy monolith. So if it's easy to work with something, you don't really want to change it. <clears throat> so now it's a bit harder to push new microservices because people are like a bit lazy and, oh, I can just change it in the one monolith. So there are, what's the pro is also, is also a drawback here. With the vertical team structure, domain knowledge is much closer to each other. Features can be done front to back. But because the platform team wasn't really added to the verticals, uh, uh, we didn't really do all of this DevOps transformation on the front-end side. And because each team now became self-contained, communication between areas became essentially non-existent. Because now you didn't really need to communicate between the front-end and the back-end teams. The problem is when you actually need to communicate, you don't really know how to start. Back then, we had these daily scrum of scrums where every team came together. That was a good forum to, to talk about your problems. Now, because it's so rare that you have to communicate, you actually forgot how to do it. So <clears throat> finally, let's talk a bit about our future. So our main goal at the moment is to redefine the platform team. As stated before, it has to be short-lived to be really successful. Uh, we need to spread the knowledge around all of the DevOps concerns. We need to make sure that all teams know how to do the changes. We need to involve other teams uh, in this stuff. And we want to rebrand ourselves as a proper vertical specific for one area, which will be security. 
more automation, it's really good that we, we actually have our deployment scripts uh, that deploy our Docker containers, but it would be so much easier if we use a tool that can do that for us. Because, I mean, at the moment, our Ansible scripts are basically doing what Kubernetes would do for us, but it's, it's built by us, we need to support it. It might be much easier to just, just remove everything around starting up services, uh, gradually deploy new stuff with a tool that can do that for you. So we are probably assessing Kubernetes and to do actually continuous deployment where possible. Unfortunately, we are a regulated environment. We can't just go full continuous uh, deployment, but we, we are trying to push it. Uh, we had a really good idea in one of the previous conferences where how can you do continuous deployment in a regulated environment? You just overload the regulators with tickets. If they get too many tickets, they'll be like, okay, no more tickets, just deploy it. Apparently it works for some banks. I'm not sure whether we're big enough to do it, but maybe. Uh, <clears throat> another really good thing we, we started to adopt is a presentation by ITV's uh, head of DevOps from Tom Clark. It basically is ITV's uh, DevOps transformation. The key points is that every area should own its own stack. So it shouldn't be a platform team basically owning everything around DevOps. It should be every area owning its own stack. And every area can then upgrade at its own pace. So based on those descriptions, we just recently started our, our DevOps Guild where each area sends a few members who are interested in DevOps concerns. Fortunately, every area has enough people who are interested, probably because they check Stack Overflow's uh, reports on pay, and it was like, if you work in DevOps environments, you pay the most. So they are really interested in joining us. We provide a common forum to raise questions and demonstrate new technologies. This is, for example, a place where you can talk about why builds on pipelines are slow or how we don't really know the health of our microservices and, and stuff like that. We also provide various training for the members, including Docker, Ansible, and Kubernetes. We get together, uh, we prepare some slides so everyone can, can learn. Uh, so the first few projects which we started and still in progress doing is a separate goal for each area, so each area can own its own uh, pipelines. So they don't need to ask us for permission to create new pipelines or go to the boxes or, or debug it. Every area has its own one. They can do whatever they want to. And similarly, Kubernetes deployment for each area. Instead of us pushing each team that, hey, now we're going to use Kubernetes, we set up a few generic scripts, but it's up to each area to introduce them uh, into their own teams. For example, some uh, hardships we faced with this approach is that we needed a new view on security because previously, since platform owned most of the platform concerns, it was fine that because only we knew most of the department-wide credentials to upload new Docker containers to promote containers in the artifact repository. But if we wish to give more access to the areas, we needed to go through all of our security and actually check that, okay, this is now only available to this particular area, so we have the proper like logging around who pushed an artifact, who promoted an artifact, and stuff like that. And we started a new project called Area Root, where we basically set up for each area their own uh, starting environment that contains the scripts to install a new Go server, install the, the Go agents. If they need more agents, they can just modify the, their own area stuff to start up new agents. It also contains some setup scripts to start up a, a, a basic dev Kubernetes cluster. And all of these scripts now use plain area-based credentials. So even if they get leaked, it's only a it, it only leaks for an area, and we can easily change that. It, doesn't, it won't affect uh, other teams. So far, feedback for this looks good. <coughs> uh, it already opened up some of our areas to do R&D on their own, which is really good, because previously they thought 
they have to join, join a different team to do research and development, but now they are happy that they can do it on their own. Uh, our current main concern is migration to the new stuff. Obviously, we, this was a road with, with lots of uh, trial and error, and most of our errors are still there, are still deployed, are still running, but no one took the, the effort to actually migrate them. For example, as stated previously, first, we, we just created new microservices, but we didn't really have a way of deploying them. We still have a few microservices that are still deployed the old way because no one upgraded them, they, no one added Docker support to them, no one added uh, proper deployment scripts to them. So it's rare that they have to change, but if they have to change, it's usually, oh, we can just do it the old way, no one wants to upgrade them, it works like that, which means still the old deployment scripts where we ask our operations team to do it. So that's our still main concern. We're a bit worried that there's a, this new, whole new stuff, but we need to make sure to, to push the, pre, uh, the people to actually migrate over the new stuff. So thank you very much. Do you have any questions? <coughs> yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So. Yeah. So the uh, about GoCD. So GoCD is ThoughtWorks uh, CI/CD framework. It's very very similar to Hudson or Jenkins or Bamboo or any other CI/CD tool. It's open source. Uh, you only need to pay for some uh, specific plugins like LDAP plugins if you want to do it. Uh, the homepage is go.cd. Uh, we really liked some of the ThoughtWorks projects, that's why we, we started using their uh, stuff. What we really like about GoCD, uh, other, um, so other CI-CD frameworks started to have the same uh, functionality as well, meanwhile, but I think Go had a really nice way of actually showing your pipelines in, in a graph with all of the dependencies. I think Jenkins now has this functionality, but back then it didn't have it. So for example, if we, <coughs> if we want to check how this project will get deployed to an environment, we can just click on the project and then see all of the pipelines and all of the steps and all of the dependencies. That's why we, we used Go instead of like Jenkins or others. For the Ansible part, uh, Ansible has a project called Tower and we use the Ansible Tower to actually run the Ansible scripts on our environments. Ob obviously, it has an API which you can use from remote to, to start up a, a deployment, and we use, from Go, we just basically call an endpoint on the Tower to start, start an Ansible playbook. That's how, that's how the things fit together. There's no native support because Go is basically just a plain CI-CD framework, so you can just create a curl request or or use, or just write a plugin if you really need uh, a feature like this. Yeah, yeah, so it's, it's basically similar, it's just go triggering a uh, tower to run the Ansible scripts because then we have a proper logging on what, what got triggered and Tower has a few other features. I think when we started, Tower was a, a paid product, but I think now they have an open source version as well. You might want to try it out for, for Ansible. Yeah, so obviously at the moment, 90% of our Ansible scripts do, please deploy this Docker container, stop this Docker container, make sure that the health check passes, start, uh, move the uh, load balancer when it started. So does what Kubernetes should do you, for you automatically. So we want to get rid of these 90%. 
For the other 10%, which, which is not something that you would use Kubernetes for, we still want to, to use Ansible. I mean, at the moment for our uh, Kubernetes-based based deployments, Ansible just runs kubectl. <laughs> just to make sure that we, we still have like tower, but anything that we, we think should not be done using kubectl or, or containers running in kubectl, we'll still be using, using Ansible. Uh, some of the stuff, for example, is to start up new virtual machines. We could use Terraform or something like that, but since we're invested in Ansible, it's, it's fairly simple to, to just use Ansible to start up new VMs for like Go agents if we want to. Good question. So the question was, how was the learning curve of, of, of introducing these technologies, like Ansible? Uh, mainly because we had the, the actual proper time to investigate it. Uh, we got like a simple project, try to do this in Ansible, and we did more programming. So we went together with three, four, one box, and we just 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 play played uh, play with it. And that was the main problem, which we said that. Uh, <clears throat> so the knowledge remained in the platform team because we were the team who, who started this research and development and we didn't really disperse the knowledge to, to others. So that's what we, we are changing now with actually not just trying out stuff, but actually do presentations to other teams and stuff. Uh, for other teams, once we did the presentation of how Ansible works, it was fairly good pickup because it's not like a a hard technology to pick up. So it, it, took a, it takes a while, but especially if you already have the code, you can just read it and, and know how it works. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. So you described a quite significant transition. What was the um, most difficult human challenge that you had to face in the company? Uh, main human challenge was uh, people being okay with the old, old ways. So that's as you, I think you, that's the usual uh, problem with, with changes like that. Uh, even nowadays, there are a few people here uh, in our company who's like, oh, the old legacy way was, was really good because there was one place to do it. Obviously, with microservices, you get new problems. You, testing is harder because you need to make sure that services communicate with each other to, to make sure you can test. There are other not so obvious issues. So making sure everyone gets the buy-in uh, was a bit of a challenge, but most people were okay with it because they were like, oh, this is new technology, this is something new to learn, I've been doing Java for 10 years, now I can actually do something new, which, uh, which was okay for, for most of the people. Um, <coughs> Obviously, we, we also had some, uh, because as I've said in the start, it wasn't, the managers didn't decide that we need to go DevOps. They just decided we need to fix the problem of, of the deployments. So we did get a few pushbacks from, from higher up sometimes where we like, okay, we want to introduce the, the zip file, the Ansible playbook to deploy, and then we get like, okay, but operations need to go through every line to check that it won't affect stuff. And I mean, in the first few weeks, it was like every time we wanted to deploy something using Ansible playbooks, they wanted to check every line of it. And then gradually it was like they realized it's, it's much more easier to believe in us. And uh, because they can also run diff, so they can basically check that there's nothing changed since the previous uh, deployment scripts. It does the same, just the version numbers are different. So these are the main uh, people problems that we faced. <clears throat> well, uh, the Ruby upgrade was two years ago, so that's where basically nothing was done, uh, and now it's, it's two years later. We're, we're, I'm, I'm not saying we're like massively ahead. <laughs> uh, we still, 
we are probably more ahead than some companies behind than most companies. We really, really like to, to make sure that our, the, the issues we face, especially on, on the platform side, can be fixed. So far, feedbacks look good, but I think maybe if I do another presentation next year, I can, I can talk a bit more about how, we, how you can actually fix the problems more properly, because this is sort of more like a graduate uh, approach. Just like try something out, if it works, adopt it. If it doesn't work, then leave it there and no one will migrate it and fix it. <laughs>